Michael, what is it about music that causes such deep emotional resonances in, in human minds and beings? Uh, you are both a composer and a neuroscientist. I was able to be a neuroscientist for a time, but never, never a composer, although I love music. H how does it work? Why is it so powerful? Yeah, that, that is such a good question. And, you know, I, I wish that I knew the answer. I wish science knew the answer. There's a huge field on, on music and the brain, music and uh, psychology and cognition. Right. You know, uh, we're very verbal animals and we communicate verbally. But as has been noted by many people, most of what we communicate verbally is not in the explicit meaning of the words. It's the tone and it's mm -hmm. the body language and it's the rhythm. And music almost is like a pure form of that mm -hmm. part of language. It mm -hmm. picks that part and leaves out the literal meaning of words. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just speaks to all these parts of our, our minds. This is absolutely true. Can you see that in the brain? Can you, can you trace uh, when people are having an emotional experience with music that it's not just the auditory parts of yeah. the cerebral cortex, but, but you can see the yes. emotional impact in, in broad areas? Yes, yes. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that the mechanism, neural mechanism of music appreciation is known. <laughs> but certainly if you play some of music and scan the brain, you find activity all over the place. It's a very, very rich experience yeah and you can see the difference between noise or or, sure. or verbal communication yes. and a music that has deep emotional impact. sure yeah. yeah and so for example when you see the emotion what lights up well I mean, t there are certain areas of the brain that typically light up with emotion there's uh, you know one one region there's a, there's regions in the cerebral cortex this is this outer covering of the brain that uh, seems to be so involved in human uh, higher order thought and so uh, cingulate areas uh, light up, uh, orbitofrontal cortex, uh, insular cortex, all these are regions of the cortex that seem to be involved in emotional experience. And, and these are emotional experiences in general. Yes. A and you see then with music, those areas for emotion as well as the auditory area. Sure. Yeah. Whereas if you would have uh, noise, you just have the auditory area, you wouldn't have the yeah. emotional areas. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but how that happens, that's... Uh, that's how and why, yeah. and why it's so emotionally potent, I think, is yeah. quite mysterious at this point. So, looking at your, your own personal life as a composer, as a writer, you've done novels, children's yes. books, uh, and obviously a very successful professional neuroscientist, uh, how, how do you articulate those two parts of your life? Are they just like, you feel schizophrenic, or, or is there a, some kind of correlation? I think they're all related. I mean, I think the, the, the mental processes involved in writing a symphony or writing a novel are actually very similar and very similar to writing or conducting a, a scientific experiment, as weird as that sounds. Uh, there's a certain artistry involved in a, in a good experiment. There's a, there's a certain problem of taking a very complicated scattering of pieces that are all related to each other in very nonlinear ways and figuring out how to arrange them in the right way uh, so that they're linear. Mm. Right? You think about mm. that, what it, that's what a story is. It's a vast association yeah. of ideas, right. but you have to put it on the page one thing at a time and you yeah. have to find the right order for it. Yeah. It's the same thing in organizing music. It's the same thing in figuring out the right way to organize your experiment to get at these deep concepts or build a theory out of a scattering of, of, of what seems disparate data. Mm. Uh, to me, it all feels like the same thing. And certainly they're all uh, elements of consciousness, of our uh, awareness of things. You couldn't do any of this unless you had this quality that some call mysterious, which you do not, uh, of consciousness. I think that's, that's true, I th <laughs> yes. Uh, and so the capacity of a being with this consciousness to do all the wonderful things that you do, from composing symphonies and writing books to designing experiments and figuring out how the brain works, um, you see all of that in in a uh, very uh, materialistic way. Yeah. yeah that yeah. You, you don't need any uh, any uh, mysterious uh, spiritual thing no. to make that all happen. I don't think that a mysterious spiritual explanation is satisfying. Uh, I don't think it's as satisfying or exciting as actually having some real understanding of what's going on. I I, I would say also, you know. 
awareness, consciousness, these are tools that the brain has to help it do really complicated tasks. Uh, and, um, and, you know, these are things that are almost certainly uh, ultimately programmable into computers. Uh, as, whether, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But, uh, you know, artificial intelligence may also uh, end up with these same tools and, and uh, do some of the things that we like to think of as, as exclusively human.